Okay, so we're being recorded now. Ben, can you uh, help mute people that are uh, uh, at least during the seminar? So, unless yes. people want to ask a question, I think, yeah, Gilad can do that. So, Gilad, you, you that take care way. of that, right? Yeah. Okay. But until we start, we can let people chat in the background. It's okay. <laughs> I'm used to the sound of barking dogs. So. <laughs> yeah, hello, hello. Yes. Yeah, so we'll wait a few more minutes for people to trickle in before we start. Hi, Sophie. I haven't seen you in a while. Sorry, I turned my mic on. Hi, Ben. Um, yeah, no, I'm. I'm kind of doing it. I'm. I'm. I constantly struggle with chronic fatigue, um, but you know, I'm much better than I was. So have to Very be uh, grateful for that. Very good. Great, you can join us. Good morning, Odd. I, I basically I've recommended this talk to all my students. Uh, so <laughs> good morning. Good morning. That's great. Uh, do, do, do you happen to know uh, Jeff Kopp? At, uh, he's in the, you know, in the, I guess the kidney subdivision at NIH, but um, I just was wondering if there was I, maybe NIH is just so huge that... Uh, is he in the right kidney uh, division or the left kidney division? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I've met Jeff. Uh, yeah, we don't, okay. He's in a different building, so I don't get to see him very often. Yeah, he, he, he basically said he, he knew you. I, he was my roommate at Harvard, uh, you, know, you know, a zillion years ago. And, and when, I, when, when you and I emailed a bit, I said, Oh gee, Jeff, do you, do you know Odd? And and he went, yeah, I, I I recognize him at a distance. I don't see him very often. That that's what that was what his comment was. Yeah, we, we used to have retreats, institute retreats, but the last one is about ten years ago. Uh -huh. I think that, that's about the only time that we ran into each other. Yeah. Well, good. good. Morning again, Doctor Max. Ah, no, Bill got his screen working. Very good. 
Okay, so maybe we should start. Welcome everyone. Great to see you all here. And I'm particularly happy that we can welcome Ad Bax today from the Laboratory of Chemical Physics at the NIH. One of the most famous NMR spectroscopists and, and uh, chemists in general. And as you probably all know, he has established many of the key NMR methods for investigating the structure and dynamics and, and folding of proteins. So it's wonderful to have him here for our webinar on protein folding and dynamics. There's uh, of course one big disadvantage of a webinar, which is that Ad cannot bring his bike as he often does when he travels, but I'm, I'm sure it'll still be fun. And we just heard that biking in DC is now very difficult because of all of the snow. Okay, so a few words about Ad's career. Ad did his undergraduate training at the University of Delft in the Netherlands in engineering, and then did a PhD you know, between Delft and Oxford, then had a postdoctoral stay in Colorado. And in 1983, he joined the Laboratory of Chemical Physics at the NIH, one of the best places, if, if not the best, to study protein dynamics. And uh, he is there now an NIH distinguished investigator and the chief of the section on biophysical NMR. His work focuses on the development and application of NMR in particular for the, the structure and dynamics of macromolecules. And so he's done enormous amounts of work on methods for ranging from resonance assignments and structure determination to dynamics, to extending the, the molecular size limit on protein folding and on a huge range of different systems. And with all of this, he's been incredibly productive. He's one of the most highly cited chemists and his work has really, I think he's really made NMR into what it is today, right? An essential technique for biomolecular structure and dynamics. And so with all of his achievements, it's not surprising that there is a long list of awards. And for instance, just a few examples, uh, he got the Hans Neurath Award of the Protein Society, the Welsh Award. He's a member of the National Academy and of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Sciences. And I, I could go on uh, for a long time, but I will stop here not to take more of your time, Ad. And so we're honored to have you here. We very much look forward to your seminar on folding and misfolding. But before we start, uh, as usual, a few technical points. I would like to ask everyone to switch off your microphones now. Um, if you have a question, please just uh, put it into the chat window or just say, I have a question, and then we will call you at the end to ask your question. As usual, our talk, the talk will be recorded, and you can also watch it on YouTube afterwards. Uh, and in case you leave us before the end of the discussion, which we will have after the uh, after Ad's talk, um, I would like to mention that now that the conferences are starting again, we switched to a roughly monthly schedule now with our webinars. And our next lecture will be on March 14th by David Nesbitt. And for more details, please see our website, proteinfoldinganddynamics.com. But now, without any further ado, Ad, wonderful to have you here today, and the screen is yours. Uh, thanks, Ben. Thanks for this uh, very kind introduction. You make me blush, but on the screen, you probably can't see that. Let me see if I can share the screen here and um, find back what I was. Is this the right one? Yeah, here we go. Uh, Uh, I hope you can see this. Yes, looking good. Uh, get my laser pointer to go. Uh, let me start out by, by again, thanking uh, both you and Hilal for uh, organizing this incredible webinar series. It's been a lot of fun uh, seeing all those uh, very nice presentations during the pandemic period. And I apologize in advance. I realize that NMR spectroscopy is sometimes like the scary branch of spectroscopy among uh, you optical spectroscopists because we tend to make things very complicated with pulse sequences and all kinds of uh, Google to gook that goes on here. 
And I'm in part responsible for that, but I'll try to sort of do an NMR 101 and keep the, the trickiest bit out of it and um, show you what, what kind of interesting things we can get. And I wanna talk about a couple of projects. Uh, the first one is to identify transient structure in IDPs. And that's a bit of a holy grail of the IDP community, right? Because we realize that even while there's lots of IDPs and unstructured proteins and unstructured regions, when they are in action, they bind to something and they have, they adopt the structure. And frequently that structure that they adopt in the bound state is foreshadowed as being transiently populated in the uh, unstructured, uh, denatured, whatever you want to call it, state. So um, I want to show you some NMR technology that we developed that is very close to what you're used to, that's using use of denaturants to identify the presence and the actual structure of such transient elements. And then a, a second project I want to talk about is the effect of pressure jumping uh, to study protein folding while it's going on by NMR spectroscopy. And that latter project is a close collaboration with Phil Anfenroot uh, that many of you probably know. Um, he, um, he's a time-resolved crystallographer, time-resolved anything really spectroscopy, and an incredible capable uh, smart guy in engineering things. And early on, and sorry, I put in this one little distraction slide here, uh, collaboration with, with Phil, we looked at speech droplets in terms of the, um, the virus spread going on during the, uh, the COVID pandemic. And early on, we wanted to alert the public to the enormous amount of um, droplets that come out of your mouth when speaking. And uh, this is a little video that at one point we, we made to convince the people that it's not just Phil, this is Phil's face here that you're seeing. Spit happens. Who spits when he speaks. Spit happens. Spit happens. Even I spit. Spit happens. Spit happens. Okay. Spit happens. And this was the youngest member of our team, more enthusiastic. But as you can see, everybody puts out droplets when they, when they speak. And we believe those are responsible for most of the, uh, the virus transmission that's been uh, plaguing us for the last couple of years. In any case, back to science. Um, we published a paper about half a dozen years ago where we looked at the A-beta-140 peptide in the A-beta-1 to 42, and we said, hey, they have very similar chemical shifts. There, it was well established that those are not adopting regular secondary structure in solution. And you look at the chemical shifts, you compare them in black is the uh, 42 residue peptide and in red, the 40 residue peptide, you see they're virtually identical, right? You really can't, these are secondary chemical shifts. So that's how much they deviate from random coil. And the difference from random coil is very, very small. So we concluded, hey, this is really as close to random coil as you can get. And we said the population of any ordered structural element is very small. And we actually gave a number. We put a number on it of 10% in that paper. Now, if you look carefully, there's a couple of things here that made me worry already at the time. And it is, if you look at residue 37, it's this one over here. It is a different chemical shift in the 40 versus the 42 residue long peptide. And it's far enough from the C-terminus that it's more than what you would expect for just a chemical end effect. Because three residues from, away from the terminus, it really should be close to its normal random coil chemical shift. And 38 here is also somewhat different. And then there's also a paper by uh, Zagorski back from uh, almost 20 years that showed that if you oxidize methionine, methionine 35, the uh, fibril formation tendency goes way down, at least for A beta 1 to 42. If you look for A beta 1 to 40 and you oxidize the methionine, you see nothing changes. But for 1 to 42, the slightly longer peptide that is more amyloidogenic, we see small chemical shift differences between say residue 37 in the oxidized and the reduced methionine state. And here for residue 38, even further away from methionine 35, small chemical shift differences. Nothing normally you sort of say, well, this is so close. Uh, that doesn't mean anything, but yes, it does mean something. And what it means I'm trying to get after, go after, by using a technology that's also been around for quite a while. And 
Fleming Paulson was one of the first ones to really highlight this, but others have been active in it, Robert Conrad in particular. He says that if you've got one of those IDPs, and it has transient structure, in this case, the ACBP, the acyl carrier binding protein. If it's acid denatured, it's not totally denatured. It still has a bit of helical chemical shift. This is the chemical shift is a function of residue. I'm looking at the C alpha chemical shift, the difference between your true random coil and the actual chemical shift measured. And you can see when you add urea, the chemical shift gets closer to random coil. And this small secondary chemical shift here of about 0.8 over ppm suggested to Fleming and his colleagues, it's about 30% alpha helical. And all the other work that's been carried out is uh, urea denaturation of unstructured or transient destructured proteins is focused on those helical proteins, which are relatively easy to do. And it's, it's good technology, but for beta sheet, it so far had failed and it had been very difficult. Now, we're looking at a much smaller fraction, it turns out, for this A beta 1 to 42. We're looking at a small population of, I'll show you, it's going to be about 10%. So we've got to be far more careful and tricky about what we're doing. Now, first, of course, I mean, all of you are familiar with the urea denaturation as a function of, of urea. You're going to change the population of your folded and your unfolded state. If your protein is so stable that you can't unfold it at urea, at high urea, um, then you would get a curve like this. But for IDPs, we're going to be at the tail end of the denaturation curve. It would be folded over here somewhere. And we just have a, still a tiny fraction that is not uh, unfolded. All right. So we can write the, uh, the ratio between the folded and the unfolded state as. Uh, a factor A that then is going to decrease when we add urea with an exponential uh, factor here and your uh, cooperativity factor, the M factor that many of you are familiar with. And obviously the, the free energy drops linearly. Uh, the difference scales linearly with the concentration of denaturant. And this M factor, as all of you probably also know, scales with the difference in the surface accessible, uh, solvent accessible surface area. Now, that means that if you've got a small folded nucleus, this sensitivity is gonna be very small because the difference in surface area, solvent accessible surface area is gonna be small. So this thing is gonna be pretty flat here. Now, what we're measuring by NMR is the average chemical shift between the unfolded state and the folded state. In this case, if it's 10% of the time folded at zero urea, you would end up with very small differences from random coil that differ by, say, 10% of what you would expect versus a folded protein. Now, you can rewrite that, that, that experimental chemical shift as a, um, basically, it's the unfolded chemical shift plus this A, that's the equilibrium uh, ratio at, at zero urea times this exponential, times the difference between the folded and the unfolded state. So we're looking at this tail end, like I said, a decaying exponential as a function of denaturant concentration. And as you can see here, you're never gonna be able to unambiguously separate this delta F minus delta U, that's the chemical shift from this factor A because if I go for a very large A, I would have a very small difference here and vice versa. Now, obviously, if it's in the folded state, we need to have reasonable numbers for those chemical shifts in the folded state. We know what a folded protein looks like. We know what the chemical shifts in folded proteins are. So we can restrain the difference between the folded and the unfolded states to reasonable numbers, all right? So that's what we're gonna do. And then the second thing that we're going to do is we're going to say, if you look at different residues, they all need to have the same A value and they need to have the same M value, all right? Because we're going to look at this, we're going to look at different nuclei, different resonance frequencies, different deltas, that is, for different nuclei, but all of them need to be fitted with the same A and with the same M. So we're going to make our life a little bit easier that way. And if we start looking now at chemical shifts, and these are two-dimensional NMR spectra, and I'm focusing in on this glycine 37 
looking at here at A beta 1 to 42, the long peptide, and then uh, in purple is the, uh, the, the short peptide. And we see chemical shift differences when we add urea. And it looks like they're going to converge here. Let me, see, let me look at it. Or if you look here, we're looking at the glycine 38. That's actually more interesting. We see that the uh, 42 residue long peptide at high urea, it goes, uh, goes downfield here, whereas the other guys go upfield. And the oxidized version of the A beta 1 to 42 doesn't budge at all here. It sort of stays, stays put. So clearly they behave differently and they're going to converge. And if you were to go to infinitely high urea, which of course we can't do, you would end up somewhere over here. Now, we've got to worry about the effect of just the, the solvent change that's also going to impact the chemical shift. So we use a reference peptide of just a couple of residues long that doesn't have any secondary structure. It's too short to make secondary structure. And we look at the effect of urea of the solvent on that. And that's shown here in black. So those are synthetic peptides. And we look, you see, you see they all go roughly in the same direction, but superimposed on that, we've got this effect of denaturing our unstructured or transiently structured peptide. And here you can see that uh, we're doing this actually, we're looking at carbon-13 nuclei as well. Uh, these are the carbonyl chemical shift. We have to do what are known as triple resonance NMR experiments, uh, three-dimensional spectra. And each of those peaks now corresponds to one peak out of a three-dimensional NMR spectrum that have been superimposed for the various peptides. So you're looking here at 40 three-dimensional NMR spectra that are on top of one another. Now, there's a technical problem here that you got to do this in, in urea, and urea is actually attacking uh, the peptide here at carbamylation, uh, modification of the lysine and arginine side chains. Uh, so you got to do it very quickly. And we've got to work at low concentration because we've got to prevent fibril formation. So all of those things normally go against NMR. But nevertheless, with new technology that's been introduced in the community uh, some over the last 20 years that's referred to as non-uniform sampling, we can actually get spectra pretty quick. We can record one of those 3D NMR spectra with very high resolution in less than an hour using an in-house program that's referred to as SMILE for reconstructing data that have been collected uh, far faster than a normal 3D NMR spectrum. In any case, what you can see here then is you're comparing the carbonyl and the, uh, the nitrogen correlations here. They're all going to converge to the same numbers. Um, like I said, you've got to subtract out the effect of urea on the individual amino acids, and it depends on the amino acid type. You can see here, they just titrate peptides, and we're looking here at the lysine or an isoleucine or an alanine. They all have different dependencies intrinsic dependencies on the urea concentration. So you've got to account for that kind of thing. So it's a fair bit of work to subtract it out, but it's conceptually very simple. And when we do that, here you sort of see those corrected after subtracting out the, the, the free peptide chemical shifts. They're all going to converge to the same number if we go to high enough denaturing. So we can calculate back what is the chemical shift at for the folded species at zero urea. And one can get independently, you can see here, independently fit this equilibrium constant in the M value. The M value turns out to be very small. It's about 0 0.06 or so, corresponding to about 400 square angstroms for a buried surface area, and an A value of about 0.11, which means 10% folded. Now, the question then is, what is this folded structure, this transiently folded structure that is present in the A beta 1 to 42 peptide, but not present in the A beta 1 to 40 peptide. And like I mentioned, we can actually get those chemical shifts of that 10% folded species. And several of those nuclei, if you look at glycine 37, for example, the nitrogen chemical shift has a very unusual characteristic, nine ppm downfield chemical shift and an upfield chemical shift for glycine 38. And those chemical shift differences became smaller when we went up in urea, remember? And there's some other chemical shifts, carbon chemical shifts, that are somewhat removed or quite significantly removed from random coil. So once we know what chemical shifts are, we should be able to figure out what 
the structure is, but it's sometimes not unambiguous. Now, in this case, we're lucky because what we can do is we can use those chemical shifts and we can go through the chemical shift database and we can ask ourselves, is there any 10 residue fragment in the chemical shift database of any protein that's previously been studied that has the same chemical shifts? And lo and behold, for the best 10 fitting fragments that come up, eight out of 10 are a type one, a type one prime beta turn, all right? There's one that uh, is a, a type two uh, beta turn, and then there's one that was extended that really fits very poorly. And the chemical shifts of those, of those eight out of 10, fit perfectly with what we observe in, uh, with our urea titration. So we therefore strongly suspect that it's this type one prime beta turn that is the transiently occupied species. Now, it's still a little bit shaky because chemical shift interpretation, I mean, you never know. And it could be that you see, we had one that didn't fit, um, right? That, that is an extended structure. Nevertheless, the chemical shift sort of agree. Now, do we have other evidence? And it turns out that we did actually, we weren't aware of it, but a couple of years earlier, we had published a paper to, um, to show that um, we can record spectra with non-uniform sampling, the technology that I, I mentioned uh, rapidly. And we can do this on this uh, a beta peptide when we go to very high hydrostatic pressure, in this case, three, three kilobar. And we can then go to high concentrations of the peptide, 1.2 millimole, and prevent oligomer formation or fibril formation. And in, at that high pressure state, we were able to see a couple of long range NOEs. We actually mentioned that, but there were only two that we were able to identify in the paper. And one of them was between isoleucine 41 and methionine 35, this very weak little thing. Now this comes from this 10% populated transiently folded species. It's consistent with it. And the same, this other NOE that we see here, those are only seen in, in this structure when the N and the C terminal uh, end of that hairpin are in close proximity. So they matched very nicely with those structural elements that we were in, were in the, the PDB. Now, another technology that we can use for studying transiently folded species, and Marius Klor showed some, some nice data for that in his seminar, is the use of paramagnetic relaxation. And what we do here is we actually attach a spin label to the C terminus. We mutate the C terminal alanine to a cysteine and put an MTSL tag on it. Uh, it's paramagnetic. So any residue that comes close to the spin tag will be attenuated or obliterated. Now, interestingly, even while residue 38 is close to, in sequence at least, it's close to the C terminus, its resonance is barely attenuated, meaning that it really isn't that close in the folded state. 37 is attenuated a little bit, but it's still visible. Other residues like 33 are completely gone here. 25 is attenuated. So it's not just a random coil that is, is, going, uh, that is playing here. It's, it is transiently ordered. And if you look at this hairpin, like I said, this, this C-terminal uh, spin label will come close, close to this, this area in the transiently folded state. So if we look at the intensities in the paramagnetic versus the diamagnetic state, you see an enormous attenuation below the sensitivity detection threshold. Those residues completely disappear because they're obliterated by the spin label here. By contrast, these residues here remain visible because they're pretty far away from the spin label, all right? If we add urea, now in the presence of eight more urea, these guys become visible again because this transient beta hairpin breaks up and it becomes more or less your regular random coil. All right, and you can compare here. This is comparing to the structures that we took from the, the PDB. Um, that, yes, in, in those uh, structures from the PDB, we end up with high values for the expected paramagnetic relaxation rate and low values for the residues that remain visible. That's these residues here. So it's pretty, pretty clear cut and surface area, buried surface area that we got from uh, those PDB elements 
was 370 uh, square angstroms in very close agreement with the, with the M value that we measured here. So this is the kind of stuff I think that is quite applicable to all kinds of proteins. One has to be careful, but it's pretty pedestrian, straightforward NMR. Uh, now I'd like to, to switch to um, what, I, what I find more interesting work uh, related to hydrostatic pressure. And like I mentioned, uh, this wouldn't have happened without my colleague, Phil Anferud, who actually was able to build equipment that allows us to switch the pressure very rapidly. And then there's a number of postdocs that, that have been involved in this that played actually key roles in, in all of the work that I'll be showing you. Uh, it started out with uh, Julian Roche, who joined a group trained by Kathy Royer uh, in high pressure NMR, a very bright young guy, um, hard work and, and he said, let's, I'd like to do high pressure. So we purchased uh, commercial equipment developed by George Wand, another pioneer in this high pressure NMR. And what you see here is that we record an NMR spectrum, in this case for HIV protease. It's a dimeric protein uh, extensively studied by NMR spectroscopy, of course, one of the, uh, the key drug targets against HIV. You put it under pressure. At one bar, it gives a beautiful NMR spectrum. At two and a half kilobar, it gives an NMR spectrum that is characteristic of a fully denatured random coil state. Interestingly, at 1200 bar, we see both the unfolded state and the folded state. And that's, that's pretty well known, and one can study the energetics and, um, and look at what's going on. But to me, the interesting bit was that if you reduce the pressure, you do this even at NMR concentrations of, of half millimole, it nicely refolds, you get your original spectrum back. So you can keep on repeating this. You can do this thousands or tens of thousands of times if you, if you have the patience to do it. So originally, I, Julian and I sort of said, well, it'd be nice if we could study what happens between here and here when the protein is refolding. And originally, we were doing this manually. I would yell at him, close, open, and he would open the valve and we tried to get spectra, but it clearly wasn't fast enough. And that's where Phil Enfarut came into the picture and I asked him, can you help me modify this equipment? And he said, he sort of laughed and says, no, that's not the way to go. Um, I'll build something for you. And before I show you what he built, we will be talking mostly about ubiquitin in the next couple of slides. Um, ubiquitin is one of my favorite proteins because it's very easy to study by NMR spectroscopy. It's easy to express in, in milligram quantities and it's stable as a rock. Now stable as a rock, means that you need five kilobar of pressure to unfold it, which is more than we can do NMR on. So the first thing that Julian proposed is to put two cavity mutants in there. And the, reasons protein, the reason proteins unfold at high pressure is because the displaced solvent volume is less in the unfolded state than in the folded state because folded proteins have small cavities. It doesn't pack perfectly. And we made it even less perfect by changing valines to alanine. So we put big cavities inside the protein, but the structure of the protein stays unchanged. You can see the chemical shifts here of the unfolded and the folded protein are the same in wild type and in the double mutant, except for the two residues that we mutated. So we're looking really at a protein that is pretty much like wild type ubiquitin, except it has those holes, those, those uh, those cavities in its, in its uh, hydrophobic core. Um, now, another question that I frequently get, especially from, from members of, of this community here, um, is, is pressure denaturation the same as urea denaturation? And, well, yes, the effect of pressure on a protein is really... Uh, very similar to adding urea. We can, in this case, we're looking here at synuclein, an intrinsically disordered protein. And we see that the radius of hydration doesn't really change until we go up to a little bit over two kilobar. And here we start getting a, a small contraction um, that's probably caused by the, the solvent changing its electrostatic properties. Uh, we see something that we always see and that had been noted in the literature before, is that it's concentration dependent. This radio of, radius of hydration comes from our translational diffusion measurements. And you've got to go to infinite dilution to get the true radius of hydration because those spaghettis, when they're uncooked, they can entangle and slow each other down. 
uh, the folded species, wild type ubiquitin, we go up to three kilobar, nothing changes. We change ever so slightly the radius of hydration by about one and a half percent. Proteins are, are very hard to compress uh, compared to solvent. The water compresses much more than the solvent. But in any case, you see the radius of hydration is almost unchanged. Now, something that's been a little bit controversial, I think, in the, the folding community, what happens when we change urea concentration to the radius of hydration? And you see here that the population of the folded state goes down. That's the blue line. We measure here the folded state as a function of urea or as a function of pressure, and it doesn't really budge for the folded state. So it stays very close to what we have for the wild type or for the fully folded state. For the unfolded state, again, we have a concentration dependence, and it stays pretty flat until we get very close or to the midpoint here of the folding and folding transition. So we don't really see much of an expansion when we go higher in urea or higher in hydrostatic pressure. Actually, we still start seeing a small collapse, just like we saw for synuclein. In any case, urea and pressure behave really very similar in terms of creating an unfolded state. And I'll show you some more data that once the protein is unfolded, it really behaves pretty much like a random coil. Now here's Phil's apparatus that he built, and it's actually uh, ingenious kind of um, uh, piece of hardware. It contains a high pressure reservoir of hydro, uh, hydraulic fluid. And it's this, this fat tube here, and you can see it here on the right hand side, it's hanging here. This is strong enough to hold three and a half or four kilobars of pressure. And we pump with a pump that is hanging here. It's now replaced by a bigger pump that sits on the floor. Um, but in any case, it's, it's pumping this reservoir to two and a half kilobar of pressure. Then we have a valve. When this valve opens, it pressurizes through a uh, stainless steel tubing, the NMR sample tube that is in the NMR magnet. Now we close this valve, we open the other valve, the low pressure valve, the fluid, the hydraulic fluid will expand, the pressure will release, and the uh, the hydraulic fluid goes back in here. The hydraulic fluid is, is uh, a mineral oil or mineral spirit that rapidly expands. It's more compressible and it's lighter than, than water. So it floats and it doesn't really mix here. And then this, this pump recompresses the fluid that comes back and puts it back in the reservoir. So really conceptually quite simple and it works like a charm. Uh, how well it works here. This is the, the early uh, beta version that Phil built. And you can see every time that it releases pressure, the hydraulic fluid shooting into the reservoir, somewhere it can get pumped and put back into this stainless steel tube that hangs in the nuclear. And this is uh, Phil uh, watching this, this early uh, incarnation of his, his device. Um, now, it's, it's not entirely uh, uh, bulletproof, I should say, but uh, it's amazing how well it worked. I mean, when I asked Phil and he said, how fast do you want to switch? And I said, well, it'd be nice if you can do a couple of milliseconds. And he says, well, I'm really a picosecond guy. I said, well, I wish you good luck. But uh, he built something that could actually switch the pressure inside the NMR sample tube within a millisecond. And what you see here is the free induction decay after applying a pulse, looking at water and the water changes its frequency. And we change the pressure right here. And you can see how rapidly we change from one frequency and all of a sudden we start mutating. And you can put this in the transverse plane and you can actually count how many dwell times there are here. And it turns out to be a little bit less than a millisecond. Now, the most amazing thing is that we can do this and we can record signal while we are changing the pressure. Imagine that the fluid that's transferring into the, through the line is a couple of grams and it's traveling at a speed of about 300 meters per second, the speed of sound. So it's like firing a bullet out of a small handgun into your NMR sample tube. And nevertheless, we can collect signal here. Now, some of you who have done NMR spectroscopy may know that normally we end up with the NMR spectrometer in the basement to keep everything vibration free. So doing this in a vibration free manner while shooting bullets into your sample was a really heroic, uh, accomplishment, I think. And uh, this involves all kinds of nifty uh, creative ideas by Phil, um, including uh, the use of silly putty, 
I don't know whether any of you know that. It's a uh, non-Newtonian uh, fluid that you may have played with if you were a kid and living in the 60s, uh, you make bouncy balls out of it. And that's, that's used for damping vibrations. Now, it turns out that this sub-millisecond switching of the, the pressure was too fast. You actually get mixing of oil and um, water at the interface, making salad dressing. So we had to, uh, to slow it down a little bit. Bill didn't like that, but for the NMR, it doesn't matter because it takes us milliseconds to record signals anyway. So we try to slow it down by putting in a mechanical restrictor, uh, a flow restrictor, uh, basically a piece of stainless steel with a pinhole. And it turns out that that pinhole would generate small uh, metal filings that, that were difficult to get rid of. And in the end, the best way to clean it out was to just use the, the device itself. And what I'm going to do is show you how we clean it by just releasing it at half pressure, not at full pressure, a little bit of fluid through this in slow motion. It's less than a milliliter of fluid. It looks like a lot, and you see the stuff flying out of the trash can below it. Uh, it, there's a lot of power behind this. Uh, there's a lot of energy, stored energy, enough to lift the magnet off the ground. If, uh, if 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 you were to sort of count how much how much energy it takes to pump up the reservoir. Uh, other things that go wrong is it's mechanical. So you keep on putting things under stress and de-stressing, and in the end things blow holes. And what you see is that after a while. Even the stainless steel tubing that's rated for 100,000 uh, PSI, it's about six kilobar, um, it will eventually break. The same, this pump that we're using eventually cracks, all right? So uh, there's a lot of practical plumbing that's involved, but uh, one can work with it. And these days, uh, Phil again came up with nice solutions to make this more robust and make those failures uh, much less frequent. Uh, back to science. When we look at our uh, ubiquitin and we look 10 milliseconds after dropping the pressure, we take a one dimensional NMR spectrum of the uh, amide region of, of the spectrum. We see effectively what looks like an unfolded one dimensional NMR spectrum. We look 65 milliseconds later, we see that this, those unfolded resonances go down in intensity and folded resonances start appearing. And after 10 seconds, we get our entirely native folded amide spectrum back again. We plot the intensity as a function of time, and we see something that first worried us. It looks like it's bi-exponential. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that this is really an artifact of the way we're doing NMR. Um, if you go to low concentrations, 150 micromole, it really folds nice, and this slow component that took seconds to refold disappears. That means that at high concentrations, we get transient oligomerization of the protein. So we're sort of limited in practice the concentrations we can work at to keep it below a couple of hundred micromole. Nevertheless, for proteins like ubiquitin, this is rather straightforward, and we can do so rather easily. Uh, first experiment we tried was trying then to ask is um, how quickly do the amides get engaged in hydrogen bonds? So how quickly do they become protected from exchange with solvent? And conceptually, this is a, an easy experiment for an NMR spectroscopist. We invert the water signal, we wait for a while, and then we just take a spectrum, all right? Now here, what we're doing with our pressure jump is we jump the pressure a little while before we invert the water. So if we, the protein is folded and we invert uh, the water, nothing's going to happen to the amide proton. But if the protein is unfolded, the amide will rapidly exchange with the bulk solvent. So we can see by changing this time to R, how quickly does a given amide become engaged in a stable hydrogen bond. And then we let it exchange for a little while, we read it out here. And when we look and we look for very short, and we do this in the presence and absence of this water inversion. So we take a different spectrum, all right? And we look at those different spectra at very short time, zero milliseconds, we basically see next to nothing. But if we keep on waiting, I mean, we, we have hydrogen exchange because, sorry, uh, during this exchange time, there is still hydrogen exchange going on, but 
I haven't given it time here to, to, uh, to refold. So if there's the refolding time is very short, we get a lot of exchange, but the refolding time becomes longer, say 200 milliseconds, then most of the guys have exchanged and this difference between folded and unfolded states becomes way smaller. Now, if you look at this decay, the decay constants, like for glutamine 40 or 41, they have very similar rates at which the amide becomes protected from hydrogen exchange. Now, two other residues here, threonine seven actually would match perfectly with the decay constant with these two residues, but serine 65 looks a little bit of an outlier. It seems like it gets protected slower. And indeed, if you plot the hydrogen exchange rates, the rate at which the, uh, they become protected, pretty much all of them, it's a time constant of about 85 milliseconds, give or take a little bit because of experimental error, except for two amides here, uh, 61 and 65, that seem to have a slower rate of becoming protected. And I'll show you later here, I wasn't so convinced yet, but uh, that these are real. There's actually folding intermediate where those guys are not in the native state. Um, another question you can ask then, is the unfolded state really unfolded? When I drop the pressure, I started with a fully unfolded protein. Now I drop it to one bar. It's trying to fold, but it's still pretty much a random coil. It turns out that the hydrogen exchange rates are still very close to a random coil, except here at the end terminus where we see a little bit of protection, all right? This end terminal is a beta hairpin. That's the first thing that's often been cited as the folding nucleus of uh, ubiquitin and, and uh, TB3 has the same kind of fold. That is the, the initial folding or fold on, sometimes referred to by some people, a uh, thing that likes to fold. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But most of it still has very close to random coil hydrogen exchange rates. Now, we can actually do something else that it, in the NMR community is known as ZZ exchange. What we can do is we can drop the pressure. We can measure the N15 frequency while the protein is still partially unfolded or partially folded, depending on how long this time is, that we wait between measuring the frequency and dropping the pressure. And then we wait till the protein is folded. We observe our signal and we can indirectly observe what the frequency was at this time. Okay, so if we keep this time tau d, that this delay time uh, very short, say one millisecond, all the frequencies that we see for the protein are still in the unfolded chemical shifts. Okay, we're measuring the folded chemical shift here, but we measure what was the frequency during this time T1 at time tau d after dropping the pressure. Wait a little bit longer, 25 milliseconds, we see both folded frequency and we see a larger component that was still unfolded or vice versa. We wait for 80 milliseconds, we see a lot of it has already gone to the folded frequency and some of it is unfolded, still unfolded. All right, so looks like classic two-state behavior. Single transition state barrier, except if you look over here, we can see this guy has a little ear. It is lysine 11. It looks like there is a little bit of something in between here that is a little bit fishy. The other thing that is fishy is that the ratio of unfolded versus folded is not the same for every residue, all right? Now, now you sort of start saying, hey, what's going on here? This is, this is pretty bizarre. Another thing that is pretty bizarre is that if you look at the disappearance of the unfolded resonances as a function of this time here, we see a fast disappearance, time constant of about 75 milliseconds. But if you look at how fast does the folded state appear, we see a time constant that's about twice as long. So, hey, how, how can that be? If it's a two-state folder, everything that disappears should be reappearing. And apparently something is missing here. So there has to be an intermediate somewhere that we're not observing here. And indeed, that turns out to be the case. And we can already tell that by looking at the one-dimensional NMR spectrum. Turns out there is a, a methyl group here at uh, upfield shifted. This is the, the methyl region of the spectrum. And we're looking at positive uh, negative you know, upfield shifted, negative PPM values. There's leucine 50, one of the methyl groups, the C delta 2 methyl group resonates here. After the pressure drop, it comes up. 
after uh, 10 seconds, it has its full intensity, but it also has a little brother here right next to it. And we see that after 25 milliseconds, the little brother has come up almost as much as the native state methyl group. So it looks like we have a separate resonance here for the transient intermediate. And indeed, we can do two-dimensional NMR on it. If this intermediate species is present here and we let it evolve for a while, and if this methyl group then switches to the folded state, we're going to see a cross peak that we are observing here between the intermediate state that would have a frequency over here, having a cross peak to the folded state, indicating that this is an on pathway intermediate between the unfolded state and the folded state. It doesn't switch back to the unfolded state. It only goes from the intermediate to the folded state. One can fit the intensities. And uh, Joseph Courtney uh, fitted those, made those fits and said, hey, we have a rate here from the unfolded to the intermediate. That's about nine per second. And then it goes from intermediate to folded at 14 per second. And in parallel, we have a direct pathway from the unfolded to the folded state at about eight per second, all right? So there's at least two pathways. And it turns out if you look at different ubiquitin mutants, we see even more pathways. Um, interesting question then that I wanted to come back to is what happens in the unfolded state while the protein is trying to fold? Can we measure its chemical shifts? And yes, we can. Uh, what we're doing here is we're comparing two NMR spectrum, one recorded where we detect the signal, the proton signal at high pressure, but the N15 is at low pressure. And the other one, we leave it constantly at high pressure. So the proton frequency is the same in both cases, but the nitrous N15 frequency is different because in one case, very briefly, we went to low pressure before the protein had folded. We can measure the chemical shift before it had folded, but while it was, so obviously while it was still unfolded, but it hadn't adopted any kind of secondary structure. There is a, uh, a, a difference that is sort of more or less uniform that you would see for a small unfolded peptide. That's because you change the solvent, the solvent properties, hydrogen bonding. So there's always this constant difference. But we see differences here, for example, for 3 and E9, there's a very large chemical shift difference indicating that 3 and E9 is, is trying to do something different. It's involved in this nucleation of the first beta hairpin. Serine 20 here shows a relatively large chemical shift difference and there are other guys that show unusually small chemical shift differences like glycine 53 here, for example. Now, other experiments we can do is we can probe and correlate the chemical shift in the unfolded state to the folded state, all right? So we can let the chemical shift after dropping the pressure, it's an unfolded chemical shift, unfolded state. We wait for a while and we measure for the same nucleus, what's the chemical shift now after the protein is folded? And then we read it out in a third dimension to get our proton chemical shifts to make our, our life easier and be able to correlate then the chemical shift in the unfolded and the folded state. And as you can see, there are rather large differences. Here, serine 20, I put an arrow with, it's the largest, one of the largest chemical shift differences. And so it, those are basically what you see between a folded protein and an unfolded protein. Um, nevertheless, those chemical shifts also tell us about what's going on in the unfolded state while the protein is trying to fold. And if we compare those chemical shifts, we can measure those not just for the nitrogen chemical shifts, but for carbon, uh, C-alpha carbon, carbonyl. And you compare them to the chemical shift in the folded state. And now we're scaling down the folded chemical shifts I should say secondary chemical shift. You're looking really at the difference between folded and unfolded. Those are the blue dots scaled down by a factor of five. You can see that actually the chemical shifts in the unfolded state correlate somewhat with those in the folded state. See, this is the correlation graph here, the slope of about 0.2 and a correlation coefficient of about 0.95. And we see that for all the nuclei, all right, the slope is about 20%, indicating that 20% of the time, this beta hairpin is already being adopted, but it's in very fast exchange. So the chemical shift still is a fairly nice, sharp resonance, meaning that the exchange process between beta hairpin and random coil 
is happening on a uh, microsecond time scale. Interestingly, if you look at the C alpha carbons, or at uh, yeah, C alpha carbons are the most most significant here. We see a small deviation from random coil chemical shift in the uh, downfield direction, indicating that most of the protein actually likes to be slightly alpha helical in the unfolded state, about 10% of the time. It's not a cooperative behavior. It's sort of transiently, this whole polypeptide likes to be alpha helical. If you make shorter peptide fragments, like six or seven residues, that disappears. We go back to our true random coil values. So the immediately after drop in the pressure, there is a slight degree of alpha helicity. And that's been seen for other proteins as well. This initial burst of uh, folding, it looks like many polypeptides have a tendency to become slightly alpha helical uh, before they adopt their, their native uh, secondary structure. Now, other interesting things that we can observe then is what is the motion, the degree of motion going on in the unfolded state, all right, while it is trying to fold. And we can characterize both the time scale of the motion by changing what is known as a spin block field strength. And we can detect the amplitude of the chemical shift changes that the polypeptide is experiencing. In this serine 20 that I pointed at before that undergoes those large chemical shift change or 3 e 9 that is nucleating the, the hairpin undergo the largest relaxation enhancement during this time. But at the same time, we're observing that the spin block field strength dependence is the same, that's the correlation graph here, is the same for every residue, meaning that there is cooperativity in this trying to fold, but failing, all right? So we see three to 5% of the time, something is happening, it's trying to fold on a time scale of about 80 microseconds, but it's failing because it's really taking 80 milliseconds before it finally switches over to the folded state. So, this is the kind of interesting detail that we can get out of our, our NMR uh, data. And we're still trying to sort of come up with, with a, a more precise characterization of what exactly are those misfolded, almost folded states that the protein is, is trying to get across. Uh, we can characterize the chemical shifts. I, I talked earlier about this. Um, this there is an intermediate state. And those two residues that had slower protection of hydrogen exchange. And to measure the chemical shifts of that intermediate, we can have this molten globule kind of, of behavior. And it becomes very difficult to measure chemical shifts when the resonances get to be very broad. And for that, we developed an experiment that is basically like your, your speed camera on the highway, where we use stroboscopic observation of NMR chemical shifts. So we put two pulses very close together just like a speed camera on the highway. And we ask how fast does the spin travel during this half millisecond time? And from that, we back calculate what its chemical shift frequency was. So even if our resonance is very broad, we can still get its chemical shifts. And doing that, uh, Joseph Courtney and Cyril were able to get the chemical shifts for this transiently folded intermediate that looked like ubiquitin except for those two amides that didn't have the right kind of hydrogen exchange protection. Now, the chemical shift differences that they observe are mostly in the C-terminal beta strand and in beta-1, the first beta strand that pairs with it, and smaller chemical shift differences in beta-3, and in this turn region where we had the two residues that had slower hydrogen exchange protection. So this is the nitrogen 15 chemical shift as a function of residue, and negative and positive are open and, and solid bars. Looking at the other chemical shifts, you look at these are the nitrogen chemicals, nitrogen that have the most pronounced effects, but we look at C alpha carbon or carbonyl. This is the carbonyl, and these are the C alpha carbons. We see similar chemical shift differences, but mostly in the C terminal region of the uh, peptide chain. Now, like I showed you before, knowing the chemical shifts, we can reconstruct what the likely structure of the protein was. And indeed, using the chemical shift Rosetta modeling uh, program, they were able to come up with a folded state, but the C-terminal strand is out of register by two residues. It has a retracted strand conformation. So everything fits, looks perfectly. If I would have looked at this protein, it says this looks like ubiquitin, except the strand is two residues out of register. 
Now, he got all excited about this. Or at first I said, you guys are crazy. This, this can't be correct. But then they proved me wrong because he said, we can measure NOEs. We can measure distances for this transient the existing state. So they did an NOE experiment, dropped the pressure. And even while we get only this transient population of the intermediate, we get transiently short distances between, say, residue 4 and 69, or between 3 and 67 that are absent in the native ubiquitin. And if you look carefully at the three-dimensional NOE data, you can actually identify, yes, this transient retracted strand is present. Uh, Joseph did one more experiment that I thought would be absolutely impossible. Um, he measured residual dipolar couplings by measuring just after the pressure drop, the orientation of bonds, adding filamentous phage to the uh, protein solution is something that is, is commonly done for um, studying structure of, of uh, static folded proteins. But here he's trying to do this for the intermediate. And what he finds then is that the residual dipolar couplings that he can measure for his transient intermediate state agree fairly well with actually structures that were in the database that had been discovered for ubiquitin then bound to the pink one kinase. That's an activated state where serine 65 becomes phosphorylated. And those X-ray structures had shown exactly the same feature as that they had found in their retracted strand. So this is work by, by Commander and uh, Freund from uh, Cambridge University. Um, and so those, those retracted strand uh, conformations, there is precedent for that, and they can actually be favored once we were to phosphorylate serine uh, 65, or if you mutate leucine 67. And the conformation of this, this retracted strand turns out to be closest to the one that is found in the, the pink one kinase. It, it's up here, it's not like some of those other structures. So we can get detailed information on the structural intermediate, but most importantly, or most interestingly to me was that indeed isoleucine 61 and serine 65 are exposed to solvent and able to, to exchange. And we're therefore uh, explaining why they became slower in uh, the rate that they became protected. Now, I, I realized uh, time is flying here. Um, I was gonna show you some, some more data on A-beta. In the meantime, uh, Phil developed a, a mobile incarnation of our pressure switch device. So we can do this now at 800 and 900 megahertz. So you see the two of us wheel this thing across to a different building. And I'm holding the, uh, the sample cell that gets inserted into eight or 900 megahertz magnets. And we can do all kinds of, of new um, experiments now, not being stuck to doing this at relatively low 600 megahertz fields. Um, this interesting work on a beta oligomerization that you can completely reverse at high pressure. Um, we can't reverse fibril formation, but we can reverse the formation of oligomers. And what you can see here that the normal NMR spectrum um, disappears after we drop the pressure. At high pressure, we get a nice unfolded spectrum. We drop the pressure, the signals disappear. And vice versa, if you raise the pressure, the signals come back. But it's on a second kind of time scale. Now, Seconds is a little bit too slow for us, but nevertheless, we can sort of see and we, can, we get those uh, oligomeric states that have been characterized by uh, electron microscopy. Not every residue disappears at the same rate, so we can get some information on this. Um, a problem that we have is that what we don't have for folded proteins, that for these, those A-beta peptides, we keep on repeating this pressure cycling. Eventually, it starts forming pressure-resistant fibrils that look different from the, the native uh, A-beta fibrils. They form the short, stocky fibrils rather than the, the nice, long uh, fibrils that, that Rob Tico uh, has done this, this beautiful solid state NMR spectroscopy on. So these have a somewhat different morphology and they don't dissolve at high pressure. So um, it's basically Dar Darwin at work. You keep on cycling high to low pressure in the end, the, peptide finds a different morphology that is resistant to forming uh, pressure, uh, to resistant to unfolding. Now, 
an experiment that I'm sort of proud of, proud of and it's the last one I'm, I'm showing you, is that we can actually study this oligomeric state of the A-beta peptide, even while it's a slow process, a seconds type of process. And what we're doing here is we first creating nitrogen 15 magnetization, we're dropping the pressure, and we're gonna wait for five to eight seconds and normally all magnetization would have disappeared. It would have fully relaxed. So by the time we go back and observe our signal, nothing would remain because it would all have relaxed. Now, if we form oligomers during this time, those become big molecules, almost like a solid. Solids are known to relax much slower than the, than the small molecule, than the, the disordered uh, state of the polypeptide. So even after eight seconds, we get those blue signals, all right? So we get the information on what happened during the time the polypeptide was oligomerized. If we wait for a very brief amount of time, we can see all the signals. Those are the red signals. The red signals for the N-terminal residues disappear when we wait for a while, whereas for the C-terminal signals, the C-terminal residues, they remain. So we can measure the rates at which they disappear and reappear, and we can see that there's those two regions in the polypeptide that are preserved when we go to low pressure for even for quite a few five or eight seconds. So we can measure the, the motional behavior and we can see that the N-terminal in those oligomers remains unfolded, whereas the, the other regions here, the more hydrophobic regions, become highly ordered. It's not some kind of uh, group. It is really highly ordered to have such long N15 relaxation times. Now, I realized I, I went over time, so I want to stop here. Um, we could, oh, sorry, the one more thing, we can measure actually how fast do those oligomers form. Um, they form very rapidly. We can see them grow by probing the rate at which they relax while we're at low pressure. And we form oligomers that are like a mega dolphin within about five seconds, all right? We can see the change of relaxation rate when we probe here over here or five seconds later. So we start out as small oligomers that relax like a hundred kilodalton. And in the end, they relax like a megadalton particle here. So I hope I've piqued your interest. NMR really can do a lot of stuff. Um, and I think, especially for studying protein folding, we're only sort of like seeing the tip of the iceberg. There's really a lot, lot more work that needs to get done. And I hope if there are students uh, listening here that I get you interested, there might be postdoctoral uh, positions to do this kind of work here at NIH. All of this work carried out in a nuclear fallout shelter with uh, taxpayer uh, funded uh, money and no bicycles in this uh, building allowed, but nevertheless, it's, it's a good place to be working. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ad, for a wonderful okay. talk and uh, the fabulous NMR and pressure experiments and the amazing details visible with NMR and also the, the limits of, the, of our cherished two-state approximations that we like to use in protein folding. And you can resolve all of the little details there. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. We already have uh, quite a few questions here in the chat. The first question from Lila Girish. Lila, please. Hey, yeah, that was uh, my head is spinning with the, 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 the results you got, and, and it's beautiful and many insights that one can obtain. Early on in the ubiquitin story, you talked about a bi exponential uh, observation, and you were saying that this was concentration dependent, and you were seeing early transient oligomer formation. Then later on, you were talking about in the A beta, where you have a much slower. Uh, transient or oligomerization. And I'm wondering, I was trying to reconcile those two observations because I think many of us would like to understand the very rapid transient oligomerization that is probably predestining various um, species to the later oligomerization. And I was fascinated and wondered if you can study that faster event. Um. Yeah, it is an good to see you, Lila. It's been a while. Um, it's, it's, it's a neat, an interesting observation. It applies not just to, to uh, ubiquitin. So we see this for pretty much every protein. If you go to a high concentration, you first go to, into this off-pathway oligomer, oligomeric state. Um, 
Now, we haven't really gone after it to sort of say, hey, what is it that is, is trapping this thing? Uh, because I consider it uh, to be more of an NMR artifact that we need to go to such high concentrations. And the optical guys here like to, to work at picomolar concentrations. So I felt sort of guilty and tried to say, hey, we're going to go down to 300 micromole or wherever we, we get rid of it. Um, so to, to make a long answer short, no, we don't really know what precisely is going on. We go to even higher concentrations, one and a half millimole uh, ubiquitin. It becomes irreversible. Some other stuff just doesn't come back. Uh, if we go to high, high temperature, you see the same thing. If you want to unfold proteins with temperature in, in an NMR tube, you're going to have the same problem that we're having here with pressure. So if you try to unfold ubiquitin at picomolar concentrations at high temperature, sure, not a problem. You try to do this at a millimole, you're going to end up with egg white in your NMR sample tube, and you can throw your sample away. Um, so yes, if I had more postdocs, um, I'd love to have one of them focus on exactly what's going on there, and I don't have a good answer. Next question from David Nesbitt. David. Uh, that's just really beautiful, beautiful work. Uh, I love it. And I'm maybe not so secretly jealous at how many, uh, how interconnected NMR is able to be able to you know, make these wonderful interactions between all parts on your protein. The question I have is, uh, you know, was really stimulated by uh, your observation of these intermediates uh, in the folding of ubiquitin, uh, or refolding of ubiquitin. Uh, and I, it made me think, you know, when you showed that you could repressurize the system after a depressure, you can depressurize in a millisecond. Is it possible to measure the kinetics, not just in one direction with your intermediates, but back in the other direction? Uh, and could you then sort of uh, apply detailed balance uh, ideas to be able to establish sort of the validity of this triangular picture for this intermediate uh, in, in the folding process? Yes, thanks, thanks. interesting question indeed. Um, it turns out that the unfolding is quite a bit slower at the pressures that we can work at in the folding process. Now that's not necessarily the case for everything we do, but for ubiquitin, we cannot trap this intermediate going in the opposite direction because it really takes like three to five seconds I to see. go back to the fully unfolded state. The kinetics is just too slow. Um, so yeah, so it, 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 it would be interesting to know, though, uh, how quickly can you repressurize? Oh, we can repressurize in a millisecond. So uh -huh. we're really hammering. Phil, Phil is amazing. I mean, he opens the valve, and this comes this is a valve that comes out of the oil industry. Uh, this is not like your little dinky valve. In the end, we have to make to slow everything down. But uh, yeah, we can pressurize. We typically pressurize in about three milliseconds. So you can pressurize can and, and depressurize at basically the same time constant, nearly the same time constant. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's not a limiting factor. Really, Beautiful. It's, it takes a while. You change, I mean, this, this barrier to go across to the unfolded state is, is apparently high enough to, um, to keep it slow. So it's really, I mean, you're, you're not destabilizing the transition state very much by going to very high pressure. That's beautiful. Thank you. Next question from Gilad. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a really exciting talk. I'm really thrilled by the inventiveness and, and, and the creativity. Uh, I will take the uh, organizer's prerogative and ask two questions. So the first is you mentioned uh, uh, these transient helical uh, formations. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Um, that, that really comes out of the fluorescence community. Um, and I'd, I'd have to look up exactly before I, I misquote who exactly reported this, but there's a couple of papers and check with me by email if you can, if you're not aware of it, I can point you to a couple of papers that point to this, this uh, burst phase, I think it's 
typically referred to in your community, where you see a, a weak degree of alpha helicity um, right after the pressure drop. Mm -hmm. And I, I forget the people because it's who actually did that. I'd have to look at, at the actual papers. Okay, I'll send you an email then. Sure. And the second question you mentioned, the similarity between what happens with urea unfolding and the pressure uh, uh, unfolding. And I was wondering if you could do similar experiments by just uh, uh, fast mixing urea in. Uh, you might be able to, or Bill Eaton might be able to, but for us, it's a, you can mix easily, but you cannot demix, right? So it's a one-way kind of thing. So if you were to yeah. do NMR, uh, it'd be very hard to do. Then now, Peter to Wright has done- flow or something. Pardon? Using continuous flow or something like that, right. a lot of material. Peter Wright has done some very nice experiments with microfluidics where they, um, they changed the pH or they diluted. I forget exactly what he did, but he did a continuous flow and uh, it's heroic work, really very, very nice um, about a dozen years ago. So there are other ways of switching rather than hydrostatic pressure in the between forward and unfolded states. Harold Schwalbe has done some very nice thing with proteins that can be uh, photosensitized to unfold and repeatably, or at least somewhat repeatably a couple of times. So there's, there's, there's other ways of doing it, but pressure, I think is actually the, the friendliest way of unfolding proteins um, because it's, it's much more reversible. You don't have to go to high temperature. Uh, you can actually use the fact that the cold denaturation that you go to lower temperature that you can actually somewhat destabilize your protein and make the NMR experiment easier. So pressure has a lot of it going for it. And almost, almost every protein will unfold at, at high pressure. And larger proteins tend to unfold easier than small proteins because they have a larger difference between the folded and the unfolded state in, in, in volume, solving displaced volume. So... Uh, it really is quite quite universal technology. And I mean, it's just our group is the only one that has the equipment right now to do it. And I feel sort of guilty because I don't have enough people that can actually have, have time to work on it, especially with the pandemic. It's been slow going around here because it had to be COVID related. And this is not really COVID related. <laughs> okay, thank you. And then we have another question by Nick Fozzi. Nick? Thanks for the fantastic talk. Two quick questions. I was wondering in the monomers of A beta, um, I guess Zgarakis and Garcia noted a long time ago by some computational methods that maybe there was some kind of hairpin in A beta 42. Is, is it that same structure that they had predicted uh, many years ago? And uh, I, I had seen that with A beta 43, that the chemical shifts actually go back to looking more like A beta 40. So any idea why that longer peptide doesn't maybe make that structure? And then are those oligomers that are mega Dalton, are they the same thing that Jinfa Ying and Marius and I looked at um, by DEST or are they different oligomers that form because they form so rapidly? Right. Uh, let, let me start with the last last question first before I forget. Yes, those oligomers are the same oligomeric states, I believe, that you, uh, Marius, and, and Jinfa observed. So they form instantly, in our case, because we started one millimole concentration and you started at 200 micromole. Um, indeed, uh, you had uh, the, the dynamic simulations. Um, there's indeed an enormous amount of computational work on those peptides. And some of that with your thesis advisor still, I believe, uh, Teresa at Gordon. And of course, uh, Nick had done some very nice work and many others. And me as an experimentalist reading those papers, I'm always a little bit frustrated because you guys show all those kind of structures, but you don't give coordinates. You don't say this is a type two beta turn, it's a type one, it's a type one prime. And it, where exactly is the turn? Now you see the spaghetti kind of thing. So it's hard to tell. This thing is a type one prime beta turn. It's nothing else. It's not a type two. It's not a type one. It's a type one prime, right? So yeah, there's like turn things found all over the polypeptide. Now, the one that we are observing here, 
is the only one that is different between A beta 140 and 1 to 42. There are other features that are present in both the long and the short form of the polypeptide. So it's not like this is the only transiently structured element, okay? Because we saw chemical shift changes that also show this cooperative or slightly cooperative unfolding with urea. And we've done it with guanidine, which is harder to do uh, as well. So you see the same thing. You see a slightly higher M value, uh, depending on what region that you look at. Um, so yes, there are differences. The C terminal, when you add that extra residue, 43, you're actually changing that beta hairpin. Actually, when we put the 42 uh, cysteine in there, we promote formation of the beta hairpin because the cysteine with the uh, empty cell label is more hydrophobic than the alanine. So we're actually favoring the beta hairpin by putting the spin label on there. And I suspect that by having three in 43 on there, you're disrupting sterically the formation of the beta hairpin, but that's pure speculation. I really don't know that but I'm not surprised that 43 would interfere with whatever 42 is stabilizing. So um, there's a lot more work to be done. This work being carried out as we speak by a new postdoc who's, who's uh, pursuing this and trying to get more uh, atomic detail of those oligomeric structures. I also had a question <clears throat> regarding a beta. Uh, if I remember correctly, then in some of your nitrogen carbon HSQCs, there was quite some curvature in the chemical shift changes that you observed. I was wondering whether uh, there is, that is a sign of, of sort of gradual unfolding of the residual structure or um, whether there is more to be learned from this curvature or whether there are other effects that can lead to this behavior. Uh, that, that curvature is really the, the exponential effect of the urea. Remember I showed you or the, the ratio or the population of the unfolded state decays like, a, like an exponential. Mm -hmm. And nitrogen and uh, carbonyl are not equally sensitive to this unfolding. So one gets this kind of nonlinear effect. On top of that, the chemical shift dependence of the peptide itself gives it a little bit of this curvature. Um, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon, but it's really the interplay between different populations. One is the, the solvent effect, I should call it, of the urea binding, which gets saturated because as soon as we got our urea tightly clustered around our nucleus, it doesn't change anymore. So there you get this nonlinear behavior coming in. So it really is a... It's a a conglomerate of the three effects at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, thanks very much. I see no further questions. So in that case, thank you very much again, Anne, for a wonderful talk. And thanks uh, to everyone for joining and for discussing. And I hope to see you again on March 14th for David Nesbitt's talk. Have a good day, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Goodbye. See you soon. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ad. Goodbye. See you. Thank you. Terrific. Bye-bye.